Hi, we're Beantown Biofuels. I'm Connor Fugier, Chief Financial Officer. Hi, I'm Fraser Reichner, Chief Chief Operating Officer. I'm Adel Atari, Chief Scientific Officer. I'm Stephanie Riofrio, Chief Technology Officer. And I'm Brooke Wojcicki, Chief Executive Officer. So the problem we're trying to address is that of the increasingly large amount of gasoline that is burned in the U.S. every year. So this amount surpassed 140 billion gallons just last year in, this, uh, in the U.S. Um, so as we know, gasoline is not a renewable source of energy, um, which is why there have been um, uh, there's there's been a lot of research going into um, actually renewable sources of energy. So one of these sources is uh, biofuels. Biofuels refer to uh, fuels that are derived from living matter. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, biofuels account for about 7% of the fuel market right now, um, but the majority of biofuels are um, ethanol right now. Um, and this is despite the uh, lower energy density of ethanol in comparison to other biofuels that um, could be made. Um, the biofuels are also typically made from um, a food source. So the biomass that is most commonly used is corn, um, which makes up over 50% of uh, biomass, um, while only 8% of that is waste. So we see this as a really large uh, untapped uh, biomass source. So our mission here at Beantown Biofuels is to use biotechnology to produce an ethanol butanol blend of flex fuel um, from discarded coffee silver skins. Uh, we can use this fuel to power um, different kinds of vehicles in a more sustainable way. The scope of our project is to prove the quality of our more energy dense fuel while also proving the scalability of our process. So here we're looking at the different properties of butanol, ethanol, and gasoline um, as fuels. The main things that we want to look at are the um, reed vapor pressure, which is higher in ethanol, and the energy density, which is higher in butanol. So this means that using a blend of uh, ethanol, butanol, and gasoline um, as a tri-fuel is going to have advantages over just uh, ethyl ethanol and gasoline uh, in that it will have a higher energy density and an improvement over um, butanol and gasoline in that it will have a higher vapor pressure. So the market we're trying to enter is that of biofuels, and uh, this market is increasingly doing more research on um, using uh, flex fuels, which just refers to a combination of different fuels. Um, right now, there is no ethanol, butanol, gasoline, tri-fuel blend on the market, which means that we are entering this market with a novel approach. Um, to narrow the scope of our project, we decided to focus on the recreational boating industry, and this is based on a study done by the uh, National Marine Manufacturers Association showing that um, this kind of tri-fuel in a specific composition is compatible with recreational boats. Um, so this is going to be the uh, main target for our product. Now the form of biomass that we're planning on using is coffee silver skins. Um, so coffee silver skins are um, a waste stream that come out of the coffee roasting process. As we can see here, um, it comes out of the very last actually roasting step. Um, and it makes up about 4.2% of the actual coffee bean. Um, so based on the large production of coffee um, just around the world, um, this is a really large amount of waste that is just being discarded and could actually be used as biomass for fuel. Um, coffee silver skins are made up of a lot of different components, but the one we're trying to target is um, the cellulose and hemicellulose, which make up about 20% of the coffee silver skins. So as a company, these are the steps we look, on, uh, look to take to bring our company to fruition. First, we want to start off with a pilot plant. We plan on partnering with Red Barn Coffee Roasters, who are located in Upton, Mass. Annually, their um, throughput yields about just under 4,000 kilograms of these coffee silver skin. And that's good for us to work on a batch scale and really hone in what it is we're looking to do and how we can optimize our process to, to get the proper flex fuel out of these coffee silver skins. From there, we look to scale up and partner with a larger coffee roaster to give us a, a higher throughput and get it closer to our production scale, something like a Starbucks or Lavazza, and really help uh, see what we can do to optimize the, the, the reaction. And then finally, potentially expanding into other markets, licensing our technology to existing biorefineries, um, expanding into other automotive markets besides just the boating industry, and creating a more robust process to give us different ratios of these flex fuels. So in order to get the biofuels out of this waste stream, it's a four-step process, first being physical treatment. We have to get it within the proper specs in order for it to go to our hydrolysis uh, step, which yields our sugars, which can be fermented by our bacteria, and then we get our ABE fuel, which, like uh, as we mentioned, needs to go through a separation process to get the proper uh, ratio suitable for the boating industry. Yeah, um, so here's a process flow diagram just outlining what Connor just described. So first we have the physical separations. 
We also have an acid and a base holding tank to control the pH of the acidic hydrolysis vessel. Uh, we have two reactors, the bioreactor and the acidic hydrolysis one. Uh, we also have a couple of filtration systems as well as our final separations of molecular sieve and a distillation column. Um, so first the coffee silver skins will be ground up as Connor mentioned. Um, and after that, the next big step in the process is acidic hydrolysis. So the whole goal here is basically to hydrolyze the cellulose and hemicellulose that Steph mentioned is in the coffee silver skins into simple sugars, um, such as glucose and xylose, to then be fed into our bioreactor. Um, so equations one through four, sorry, um, equations one through four show that both the formation and the degradation reactions of the xylose, and the goal here is to maximize the um, concentration of the xylose and glucose. Um, so to calculate concentration, we found rate constants that can be calculated using different temperatures um, and also can calculate the concentration of xylose over time using this formula here. Um, so similarly for glucose, we found rate constants in literature um, and calculate the concentration over time using this formula. Um, so we modeled the reactor in Python and we used a range of temperatures to try and find um, how long our batch time should be and what temperature we should be operating at. Um, so after performing the simulation, we found an optimal point at a temperature of about 150 degrees Celsius and in a batch time of 10 minutes. Um, so keep in mind, these reactions include the degradation, so overall our total sugar yield is about 53%. Afterwards, we'll be taking our hydrolyzed sugars and separating the soluble and insoluble components using a filter press. Once we have our stream with our soluble components, we do need to concentrate this back before we add it to the bioreactor. The stream that we have coming out is 8.82 grams per liter of sugars. We modeled a rotovap and aspen, operate at 60 degrees Celsius under vacuum for one hour, and the stream coming out does have a very concentrated amount of sugars at 500 grams per liter. The actual fermentation process will take place using a bacterial strain known as Clostridium bejonecki. Uh, we'll be using a mutant strain named SA-1. The strain has been uh, shown in the literature to have 62.3% increase in productivity and higher titers, uh, as well as a 50% increase in uh, butanol toxicity uh, over the wild type. Uh, the strain is anaerobic, so we will have to displace any oxygen in the reaction vessel. Uh, the culturing conditions will be at 37 degrees Celsius at a pH between 5.5 and 6.5. Uh, the media is uh, specific for this bacterial strain, reinforced clostridium media or RCM. We'll be supplementing it with 5 grams per liter of yeast extract, as well as previously defined salt solutions, which we've seen in the literature to have uh, effect to produce the highest titers. Uh, the cells will be added into the reactor between the exponential and stationary phases you can see here on this figure. Uh, the reason for this is because our product is growth associated, so we'd expect to see the highest titers when our cells are having a positive growth. The bioreactor itself is going to have a nominal volume of 100 liters uh, with a working volume of 70 liters. Uh, this was chosen based on industry standard of having 20 to 30 percent headspace, which allows for proper gas exchange. The actual mixing will take place with a Russian impeller. This is also an industry standard for bacterial fermentation. Uh, we'll be operating at a power number between 4.5 and 6.5 to have turbulent flow and have proper mass transfer between the sugars and the cells. And uh, finally, we'll be bubbling in 0.1 liters of nitrogen gas per liter of media per minute. Uh, this is to displace any oxygen in the environment, but also to remove any CO2 built up during the fermentation process. We model the bioreactor fermentation process using polymath. Uh, we use this equation, the logistic model of growth. Uh, this equation and this model was used specifically because it's been shown in the literature that the strain of bacteria uh, is a uh, cell density or biomass density limited growth, uh, not substrate limited growth. And we've taken our kinetic parameters based on different studies in the literature, which you can see in the table to the left. The graph output in polymath uh, is shown here. We have substrate decreasing over time in green on the top and then uh, biomass and our products increasing in the bottom um, as time goes on. And the table that we have output of the polymath shows our final titers. Uh, we have 0.283 grams per liter of acetone, 7.97 grams per liter of butanol, uh, 4.7 grams per liter of ethanol. We can see that our substrate concentration is not fully consumed, which is as we expect with this model. We start at 20 grams per liter and at 10 grams per liter. Uh, we do see that our total batch run time is 17.5 hours and that the final uh, cell density is 2.73 grams per liter. Um, so as Idle mentioned, the products <coughs> of the bioreactor consist of acetone, butanol, ethanol, and water. However, we only want to recover the butanol and ethanol for our fuel. Um, so there's a few different, different options to separate the alcohols from the water, but it's usually kind of tricky because there's an azeotrope that forms with the water. Um, so 
In industry today, sometimes uh, people will use distillation. However, using just distillation columns, you typically need up to five, which is really energy intensive and costly, so it didn't really make sense, especially if we're starting on a pilot scale. Um, additionally, you can use extraction and distillation together, but again, that requires multiple unit operations and is costly and energy intensive. Um, gas dripping has been used on the bench scale, but is not further proven, so we decided that would probably not be a good route to go. Um, instead, we've come up with a novel approach to actually remove the azeotrope before we separate the acetone, butanol, and ethanol. Um, so we think that using a molecular sieve, um, which is basically a bead with a pore structure, as you can see in the diagram here, um, so the, the pores in the molecular sieve are about three angstroms, which um, will allow water to adsorb, but the alcohol will pass through. Um, literature has also shown that these are about 95% effective, so with a series of four molecular sieves, we're able to get a product stream of less than 1% water, which we can then feed into a distillation column. Um, so we use Aspen Plus to model the distillation parameters with the inputs that uh, we achieved after the molecular sieves. Um, so the whole goal here was basically to achieve an ethanol-butanol ratio that has been shown to be effective and useful in the voting industry, which is 0.52 mass percent. Um, some other highlights is that we can use uh, differing reflex ratios or distillate rates to uh, maintain, or sorry, to obtain different ratios of ethanol and butanol, which means that we can expand into other markets that require different concentrations. So moving along to safety, um, obviously since we're starting on a pilot scale, we're going to be having really small amounts of ethanol, butanol, and acetone coming out. Uh, per about 14 kilograms of silver skin, we're only getting a little bit less than one kilogram out per batch on our pilot scale. So we don't really expect any issues in terms of safety there. Obviously, we'll follow standard safety precautions. On scale up, that's where we're going to be having a lot more issues, uh, as ethanol and butanol and acetone are obvious, obviously all flammable. Uh, they also present potential safety risks in terms of health if uh, they're inhaled at all. And uh, if there are spills, that could also pot potentially present an issue. Other than our product feeds, we're also going to have to worry about the acids that we're putting into the system, specifically for the hydrolysis reactor. Acids and bases obviously present, um, could cause acid burns, and we don't really want uh, any of our employees dealing with that. Additionally, uh, the equipment will be getting up to 150 degrees Celsius, as Brooke mentioned, for the hydrolysis reactor. That represents a uh, huge potential safety issue if everything isn't properly uh, insulated and safety warnings aren't properly labeled on the equipment. Furthermore, as we are grinding up the silver skins, the potential exists for a dust explosion. So we want to make sure that the silver skin, anywhere that the silver skins are ground up, is properly ventilated so that we don't have any of that risk there. Um, obviously, all of the equipment is going to require extensive instrumentation to ensure that everything is properly run and also working as we expect it to. And we'll, of course, be complying with OSHA regulation. 29 CFR 1900-1200, which essentially means that any of our product streams coming out are properly labeled. So now we're going to discuss some of the instruments that we're going to see basically on our process, beginning with our acid and base holding tanks. Um, essentially, the big issue that we have with the acid and base holding tanks is that if it gets too high, you have the potential risk for a spill and of acidic or basic material. You don't really want that. So we're going to have a control system that essentially says if this level is too high, release it into our spill basin where it will be basically neutralized for, uh, to be released. The hydrolysis reactor is obviously a complex piece of equipment, so we're going to be having temperature controllers, concentration controllers, level controllers on it. We want to make sure that everything that we see, uh, we can see everything going on, the re in, on, we want to be able to see everything going on in the reactor. And we also want to make sure that everything going into the reactor is, uh, we can prevent any issues. If the concentration of uh, acids are off, we can add more bases in. We also have a lever level sensor. If it gets too high, we can open the drain potentially if we need to. Uh, there's also a PSV in the case that we have an overpressurization of the tank. We don't really expect that to be an issue, but just as a safety precaution, we've added that. Uh, for the filter and rotary evaporators, we have uh, pressure controls and sensors. If the filter becomes overpressurized, it could explode, and we don't really want that to happen. Um, and obviously, we have a pressure sensor to make sure that everything coming out going into the next tank is uh, at the correct pressure. So the bioreactor is also a highly complex piece of machinery. Uh, this is going to have pressure sensors, level sensors, temperature control, concentration control. We obviously want to make sure that everything's operating properly. The bacteria isn't actually 
toxic or potentially harmful to anyone, so we don't really expect contamination to be an issue. Um, however, in some event, perhaps, of like overpressurization, we do have a PSV. We will be maintaining proper controls and observations of it to make sure that everything's operating properly. Uh, I also want to mention that we have fail open and fail close valves everywhere where needed. Um, we designed it based on what would minimize the impact on the workers there so that they wouldn't be harmed by any sort of failure. Um, and then moving along to the molecular sieve tank, the tangential flow filter. Uh, the molecular sieve tank has a concentration sensor on it. We want to ensure that there's no water coming out of the system, as Brooke mentioned, azeotropes form, and that would make separation difficult. If it goes in with too much water, that could cause issues for a distillation column. For the tangential flow filter, we have pressure control, same as the last one. We don't want that to get overpressurized and potentially rupture. Finally, we have the distillation column here. Uh, this has pressure controls on it. Obviously, we don't want it overpressurizing inlet or anywhere along it, so we want to make sure that the um, equipment is properly safe. It, of course, has a PSV and a drain on it. We'll have level controls in case of weeping or any other issues and concentration and temperature controls throughout. Finally, we conducted an FMEA to basically determine any potential issues that we might come across in uh, operating this plant. And basically, in FMEA, we establish a failure mode, a consequence for this failure, and then a possible cause. Uh, from there, we establish our RPN, which is severity, occurrence, and detection rating. And we establish this on a scale of 1 to 10. If it's greater than 30 when you multiply them all together, then we have to come up with a response plan and a potential fix. So as I mentioned before, we are looking to start off on the pilot plant scale and then uh, move full production. Um, so for that reason, we ran an economic analysis on both the pilot plant scale and the production scale. As I mentioned, we're looking to have the pilot plant in Upton, Mass, and there's two reasons for that. First being it's already an existing building. It wouldn't require us to um, build one from the ground up. We were planning on retrofitting their existing location. And that would also allow our feed stream to be on site and cut down the cost of that. In terms of scale up, we're looking to build this plant in Connecticut. There's also uh, twofold behind that. First being it's very close to our pilot scale, so it'll allow um, information exchange to be a lot simpler, as well as Connecticut being kind of the hub for this boating industry that we're looking to target and allow us to cut down the costs of distribution. So in regards to the cost of our feed streams, this table has it broken down in um, cost per unit. You can see that the most expensive part of this is gonna be our mutant strain of this bacteria. Um, and then accounting for the 4,000 kilograms we plan on working with um, from Red Barn Roasters, we get an annual cost of production around $15,000 annually. Now looking at the cost of the uh, installed equipment in this pilot plant, as uh, Fraser mentioned, the bioreactor is a very complex piece of equipment and as expected is going to be the bulk of our costs uh, up front. Um, this is because it needs uh, the, the concentration, the temperature, all that is directly related to our product, so we really need to make sure that this is uh, our most sophisticated piece of equipment it takes up about 75% of this cost. Uh, this is a class four estimate of all of our equipment that is necessary for this pilot scale process and accounting for um, installation, retrofitting these controls, um, building it on site and scaling that cost to the cost of the, uh, what it would be in the Northeast. Our ISBL is calculated to be just shy of $635,000 plus or minus 30%. Now, as I mentioned, we did run the economic analysis for both the pilot plant and the production scale. However, the focus of the pilot plant was really to just be proof of concept and hone in what we really wanted to do for the production scale. So we weren't expecting to be profitable uh, in that regard. However, however, for the production, we used a class five estimate to scale that pre-calculated ISBL. Um, our capacity goes up more than three orders of magnitude uh, to around 82.3 thousand gallons of this flex fuel annually uh, and this scaled up ISBL allowed us to calculate our total fixed capital costs along with our working capital bringing our total upfront investment to be around 21.3 million dollars um, selling our flex fuel for what seemed to be a fair market value of around five dollars per gallon that brings our revenue to uh, around four hundred twelve thousand dollars annually and after taking into uh, account our uh, production costs that brings us to our pre-tax cash flow of around $105,000 annually. 
Now, using these figures, we conducted an NPV over the course of a 20-year uh, life of the project with a standard 15-year depreciation schedule starting in the third year. Uh, we do not see, uh, we're not able to be taxed on any income until our equipment fully depreciates in the 18th year, and after 20 years of operation, our NPV comes to negative $18.8 million. Um. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, um, basically we use simulation and other data to show that an ethanol butanol blend is obtainable via this process, um, as well as introducing a molecular sieve technology as a novel way to set, remove an azeotrope and then obtain a butanol ethanol mixture, which can be used in uh, the boating or automotive industry. Um, however, as you, Connor mentioned, profitability has been proving difficult, especially on the pilot scale. Um, so we think that in the future we should look into other forms of biomass. So for example, the coffee silver skins consist of about 20% cellulose and hemicellulose, whereas corn husks consist of about 65%. So already from there we have a, a bigger input to produce more sugars and then produce more fuel. Um, additionally, if we continue to scale this up, um, an additional production plant should probably be located in some place like Brazil, which already has automotive vehicles approved to run on these flex fuel blends. Um, but we, additionally, we think that if we want to expand into the U.S. market further, we should um, try and work with the EPA to encourage them to accept or conduct some sort of study to um, use tri-fuel blends in commercial vehicles. Um, so just as a quick reminder about what we're here for. Um, we're focusing on supplying energy-dense fuel um, to try and repurpose waste biomass streams, um, and we're really hoping just pave the way of uh, the future for tri-fuel blends. Um, we want to say thank you to our mentor, Chris, who couldn't be here today. Um, he's in Texas. Um, to Professor Fluger, Don Wood, um, Tom Webster, and the entire chemical engineering department. Um, and with that, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, it includes scale up of the size of equipment as well. The only exception to that probably being with the bioreactor, because realistically you wouldn't be able to scale up a single reactor. You probably need multiple. Um, but other than that, the, it was a, considered a linear scale. <coughs> mm -hmm. Is the seed you guys talked about, is that like single use or can you regenerate Molecular that? Yeah. yeah, it can be regenerated. So um, the idea is on the pilot scale, since we'll be using very small quantities, we would probably just replace the beads, but on a production scale, um, you can set up a whole regeneration system basically to remove the water from the sieves um, by heating it up so it kind of evaporates out and then you can regenerate them and use them again. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about why you chose 150 degrees as like the ideal operating temperature? I saw the... For the hydrolysis? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, if you want to go back to the graph. Um, so basically the temperature comes into um, the kinetic, the rate constant, so like the, all the K values. Um, so when we modeled it in Python, we calculated a different K value for each temperature modeled, so at 100, 110, all the way up to 170, um, and then use those K values in our uh, concentration calculations. So if you go back to like the glucose one, for example, um, the different Ks are going to be different depending on the temperature, and then we also have the uh, small t, which represents time. So when we add the total sugar production, which includes xylose and glucose, as well as the degradation reactions, um, at 150 degrees Celsius, we hit a maximum point at 10 minutes, so we chose that as our operating conditions. I saw for the bioreactor you defined um, like a power number and a, like a sparging rate. What went into like calculating those? So the power number itself, so the equation uh, for that value uh, is dependent largely on the uh, things that we don't really have control over. So for example, the diameter of the blade, the uh, density of our media, the only thing we do have control over is going to be the RPM that we operate the bioreactor at. Uh, and again, it's between these values that we'll have turbulent flow, so that's something up to experimentation, but this is where we would start. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>